Well, hey, thanks for being here. And, uh, and just real quick, my name is Lance, and uh, along with my beautiful wife, Angel, we have the privilege of being the co-lead pastors here at Radiant Life Church. And uh, just wanted to send a special greeting to you this morning before we jump into the message. And uh, before we do, I don't know if you, were, if you were not here last week, I would encourage you, I would implore you, I would beg you to listen to the sermon that Pastor Anthony brought last week on Romans 14. He was preaching some fire. Come on, it was good stuff. He said, if you were not careful, our opinions can cost us what Jesus bought for us. Right? And if you're like, well, what did he mean by that? Listen to the rest of the sermon, and I think you'll find out why. It was, it was amazing to hear about, man, how, what does God think of our opinions, and how should we use them? When shouldn't we use them? Right? There was some wisdom there. Uh, and so I would just encourage you to do that. So thanks, Pastor Anthony, for just preaching fire, challenging us, inspiring us with the Word of God from Romans 14. Uh, before we jump in, I just want to thank a few more people. So one of our purposes, our heart here at Radiant Life Church is, is for the community in which we've been placed. We've been placed in this amazing community of Wadsworth. Our heart beats for the city. And uh, this past week, we had some individuals who stepped up their game. And that was Pastor Angel, Olivia, uh, Crystal Hersey and Lexi Hersey. Uh, they took it upon themselves. There was a need. Uh, somebody had reached out to us as a church because we had done some ministry and some community service projects at other parks in the city. And they said, hey, will you come redo some of our landscape at, our, at the dog park here in town? And of course we said, yes. And so this past week, those four set out and uh, they did some amazing work over at the local dog park here in town. And so I just wanted to recognize them and say, thanks for your service. Come on. Saw it on our Facebook page, just a way to serve, and uh, that's, that's what our heart beats for. Today, I know we say it every week, we're like, oh, we're in this series. Uh, we've been in a series for a long time, and uh, it's a sad day here at RLC, uh, because today is the last day for the Romans series. Everybody say, ah. Oh. How many of you have been enjoying this series? Come on. If you've been enjoying this series, if you're at home, make some noise. You're in your living room, make some noise. Wake your neighbors up. Good stuff. So since you liked it so much, we'll just redo it next year, <laughs> right? And then the year after that, and the year, no, I'm just kidding, right? But, but there, man, it's been such a great series to walk through the book of Romans, to unpack it. Man, powerful text, practical text, and uh, just excited. So today, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Romans, chapter 15. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, but man, we're going to, we're going to just jump into it right away. And, and Romans 15 starts off where, where Pastor Anthony was preaching last week from Romans 14. And so Romans 15, 1, it says, We who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. We must not just please ourselves. First thing I see in our text today is we put the progress of others ahead of pleasing ourselves. We put the progress of others ahead of pleasing ourselves. How, ma how many of you have children in the room, right? You have, you have some kids. How many know that there are moments in your life where you put the progress of your children above your own needs, above your own desires? You're like, man, if I can do that for my kids, I'm going to do that. We go above and beyond. We have this passionate heart where it's like, man, my kid has a need. I want to help meet that. Well, it was probably around eight years ago now. Uh, where Brie was diagnosed with her first autoimmune disease. And man, we didn't know at the time that there would be seven others to follow. But it was in that moment where we went, okay, this is pretty serious. We were meeting with a number of doctors. What well, was just at that same time where Pastor Angel, man, she was in a groove uh, where she was raising three girls, but she felt like, you know, God wanted her to go back to school. And she was a full-time student, full-time mom, part, you know, part-time youth pastor at the time. And uh, she was going to school and she was slaying it. She was getting straight A's. Right? I wasn't even helping her. She was just doing it all by herself. If I would have helped her, she would have got F's, but she was doing great by herself. And so she's getting straight A's. She's doing great. She feels like this is the direction she needs to go. And then what happens? Life happens. Right? Sometimes in the middle of life, a, a storm comes and you got to make decisions. You have to go, okay, what's, what's best, not just for me, but for others around me? And it was in that moment, I remember she said, I just, I feel like it's time to stop school. I, I, need, to, I need to focus. We're not sure what's going to happen. And sure enough, Man, there was doctor visit after doctor visit after doctor visit, and we know that that was the right choice in the season. But if you ask her, she'll do it again and again and again and again. Why? Because we put the progress of others above what? Pleasing ourselves. We put the progress of others above pleasing ourselves. And we continue on in Romans 15 with 
verses 2 and 3, because I think you're going to see here what that means when we put the progress of others before ourselves. How do we build each other up? And man, it gives us some great examples here in Romans 15. It says, we should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. For even Christ didn't live to please himself. As the scripture says, the insults of those who insult you, O God, have fallen on me. If we're going to live with purpose, on purpose, then there's some things we can learn. And so the message titled this morning is Living with Purpose. So if we're going to live with purpose, on purpose, maybe from our text today, we see some instructions of what that means, of how we're to treat other people. And in verse 2, what's it say? It says, we are to help others do what is right. Help others do what is right. That means we need to coach. We need to encourage. We need to assist people in their walk with God. Pastor Anthony talked about it last week with days and and diets. We have to lay down our freedoms, right, so that maybe it doesn't trip up somebody else who's who's a new believer, who's not maybe as mature in the faith as we are. I didn't say mature in personality, but mature in the faith. And so they're they're a young believer, and so maybe there's some freedoms that we have to lay down so it doesn't trip somebody else up. Why? Because that's what we're here to do. We are here to help others do what is right. The second thing in verse 2, it says what? To build up each other. We are to build up each other. And so if we're going to live on purpose with a purpose, we have to be willing to help others to do what's right, and we have to be willing to build each other up. I love next week you're going to hear about it. I'm not going to steal it. I'm not going to share it. I promise you I'm not going to. But, but there's some great things happening. Next week we're going to be talking about what life groups, because life groups are coming back. I know some of you are like, when's life groups coming back? Life groups are coming back. And uh, we're excited about what, what's going to take place. They're, we're passionate about it. We're, we're really, really, we're amped. You know what I mean? Like life groups are coming back. This is going to be good. But life groups, our model for life groups is doing life together. So hear me on this. We meet once a month. If that's the only time we speak to anybody in our life group is when we gather once a month, then we're missing the mission of the group because it's doing life together. Those groups are intentionally placed before us that have the opportunity, what? To encourage others to do what is right and to build each other up. We need that. I don't know about you, but I need that. Right? I need to be built up. I need people speaking into my life. I need people pouring into my life. There's days, there's weeks when you're just like, man, this is tough. And then all, all of a sudden comes along somebody from your life group who's like, man, I just feel like God spoke to me. I feel like I'm supposed to lift you up. I feel like I'm supposed to call you today. I felt like I needed to text you today. Here's a word of encouragement. And we all need that because that's what we're supposed to do as the body of Christ. It goes on to say in verse 4, it says, such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. And the scriptures, what? Give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. Verse five, it says, may God who gives the patience and encouragement help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can, what, join together with one voice giving praise and glory to God the Father for our Lord Jesus Christ. So the third thing, if you're taking notes right there, is we strive for harmony with each other. Hear me on this. This isn't going to pop on the screen, but I need you to hear me on this. This is so important. If you don't strive for unity, you will surrender to conflict. Right? If you don't strive for unity, if you don't push for unity, if you don't push for harmony, you will surrender to conflict. Now, what, what do I mean by that? That means that we have to be willing to fight as hard for unity as we do in the midst of conflict. Like, no, you, you get that moment where you get that, I don't know, it doesn't necessarily happen to me, but I know it happens to some of you because I've seen it, not in person, but I've seen pictures of it because your spouse posts it, where maybe you get that vein that pops out of your head or pops out of your throat when you get a little fired up, you get a little, we'll say fired up, we won't say angry because you don't get angry, right? But there's that, those moments where we get, we're passionate about something, whatever it is, you can fill in the blank, whatever it is, and you're like, man, I'm just going to fight for that because I know I'm right, I know it's a value, and I'm not going to let go. Would you fight for harmony or unity with that same type of passion? Because otherwise we'll surrender to conflict. As in, we'll just give up. We'll let go. We're in a season right now where it's like, oh, you disagree with me? Great. I'll never talk to you again. And you're like, no, we wouldn't do that. You ever unfriended somebody on social media because you didn't like what they had to say? Are we striving for harmony? Are we fighting for unity? Or are we giving in? To conflict? Are we surrendering to conflict? Because I love what it says. It says, what does it say in verse 5 that we are to live in complete harmony? It says this is fitting as followers of Christ, but it, it then gives this key word then. 
How many know there's, the, there's these, if you do this, then God does this. It says, then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise to God. There is something supernaturally powerful when we gather together in one room, one space with one voice. It's powerful. Now, I love that we have an online community. We have our online campus. And I, I love that they're able to join us each and every week. But there is something, there's something different when you're standing in your living room or sitting in your living room worshiping versus when you're here in God's, God's, not that his presence is in your home, but when you're surrounded by God's people in God's presence and you're lifting up one voice. So when you hear, I'm no longer, what? A slave to fear. I am a child of God. But when we sing it together, because some of you are like, mm, am I? Right? And it's okay. Maybe this morning you're like, ah, I'm not sure if I believe that. But the person next to me is singing it. The person in front of me is singing it. The person behind me is singing it. And their worship begins to inspire you. And then collectively you're lifting up one voice. It's powerful. It's so powerful. And it's obviously biblical and scriptural. We love to sing with one voice. So how do we live with a purpose and on purpose? It continues on in verse 7. It says, therefore accept each other just as Christ has accepted you you so that God will be given the glory. We accept each other as Christ has accepted us by a show of hands for those who are joining us online or in person this morning by a show of hands. How many of you were perfect and so Christ accepted you? Right, there was that moment where, where Christ accepted you and out of his mouth was like, this is per this is great. Finally, someone who relates to me. Like I was perfect in all my ways. I was without sin. I gave my life and now somebody else is joining me. No, he didn't say that. Why? Because none of us were perfect. None of us walked on water. Today when you leave, you may walk on some water, but, but that's a little bit different because um, they're called puddles and you won't walk on them, but you'll walk through them. But here's the deal. None of us were perfect, yet we were accepted by a perfect Savior. And so we have to be willing ourselves to accept others just the way Christ accepted us. That means we have to be willing to accept people in the messiness of their lives, in the pain of their lives, in the struggle of their lives. It goes on to say in Romans 15, 8, it says, Remember that Christ came as a servant to the Jews to show that God is true to the promises he made to their ancestors. He also came so the Gentiles might give glory to God for his mercies to them. And so here's the, the fifth thing. If we're going to put the progress ahead of, of others before pleasing ourselves, then we have to be willing to serve the needs of others as Christ has served us. We got to be willing to serve the needs of others as Christ has served us. Matthew 20, 28, it says, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. And so Christ himself was willing to serve and are we willing to serve? So how do we live on purpose with a purpose? We have to help others do what is right. We gotta build each other up. We have to strive for harmony. We have to accept as Christ has accepted us and we have to serve as Christ has served us. But that's, and we could end right there. Like that's five points, five principles. You took some notes, you wrote some things down. If we're gonna live with purpose right there, I think those are some great purposes we could all live by. But the book of Romans chapter 15 doesn't end there. Actually, Paul begins to um, unpack a little bit more. He begins to share about his personal purpose. His personal calling, his personal uh, desires and what he wants to see accomplished. And he speaks about his specific ministry. And then in verse 20 of Romans 15, he says, My ambition has always been to preach the good news where the name of Christ has never been heard. Rather than what? Where a church has already been started by someone else. So if you're taking notes, here's the second main point is what am I aiming for? Right? Some of the translations say that I, Paul says I aim for, or my ambitions are. You see, Paul had an ambition. He had an aim to preach to where people had not heard the gospel yet. Paul had big ambitions. He didn't know that the United States of America existed. His heart was, I'm gonna go to Spain. I'm gonna go way over there. Right? He didn't know that, that truly the word of God would be preached until the utter ends of the earth because he didn't understand there was even more earth to still be preached to. And yet here we are with those, the ability to have those same passions, those same calling, and that same purpose. And, and why are those things important in our life? Why is it important to have aim and ambition? Here's why. Because your purpose allows you to turn your good ideas into God ideas. Your purpose will allow you to turn good ideas into God ideas. You see, here I am in the city of Wadsworth. I know that it, actually, let's see. 
in, a, in a, just a few months, it, Pastor Angel and I will celebrate nine, it's crazy, nine years here at Radiant Life Church, and that's awesome. We're excited. We're still going to keep going. That's that, you know, you don't reach the nine-year mark and quit. Uh, we're just going to keep going. I got Pastor Laris in the beat, so I got to get past 20. Um, but we're going to make it there. But almost nine years ago, we came to this community. And I remember driving around the city on the streets, and we, we, just, we just were praying. Uh, we remember, Pastor Angel speaks about it, where she walked through the doors of the old, the old building. Some of you, you have no clue what the building looked like at 951 High Street. Some of you, you know exactly what it looked like because you helped build it. And uh, there was this moment where we walk in for our first service. We hadn't been in the building in a while. And you walk into this little vestibule, and there's, there's pink. It was like a pinkish, mauvous tile. And wallpaper everywhere. If you love wallpaper, it was like heaven. If you hated wallpaper, it was like, yeah, you can fill in the blank. And there's wallpaper everywhere, and you're looking at the pink moth, and you're like, ah, oh, and you just walk through the doors. And it was that moment, no joke, where Pastor Angel walked through the doors, and she heard the Lord so clearly, welcome home. Welcome home. I didn't even preach yet. I didn't even get to make the decision. The congregation didn't even vote if I would be the right selection for the job, yet the Spirit spoke directly to her and said, welcome home, right? And there's in those moments where you go, okay, welcome home. Well, ever since we heard those words, what we've been able to do because of the purpose, the calling, the aim, the ambitions that we have, we dream for this city. We dream for this city of ways that we can serve, ways that we could give, ways that we could bless Ways that we could bring the city together. We dream together. We dream with our staff. We dream with the board. We dream together with each of you as members. How can we make an impact in the city in which you've placed us? Even this past weekend, we've had multiple conversations with, with, with different people who said, hey, if you need help in the concessions, let us know. We're going to come and help. We've had conversations with the, with the Youth Football League. We've partnered with the Youth Football League. We sponsor the Youth Football League. I would, man, I, got, I had an opportunity. My girls were all coaching, the little cheerleaders, and uh, Annalise Kelly was cheering. So there was like this hour break I had in my schedule yesterday where we went and we showed and we, we were there. And you walk up, and I was like, mm, who did that? There's this giant brand new banner of Radiant Life Church. It's the only banner up on the Wadsworth Youth, Fo Youth Football football stands. And then all of a sudden I look at it, and there's this beautiful picture of Past Angel preaching. And then where my face is, someone put the logo over top of it. <laughs> this is my daughter. She did it. So I think she was trying to tell me something. Uh, but here's the deal. I was like, yes, that's what I'm talking about. Why? It's a way to serve. It's a way to connect. It's a way to give. It's a way to dream for our city. Like, listen, I love this building. I love this church. But I love this city. I love this community. I love these people. That's why we get out and we serve and we give and we invest and we look for ways. I'm just going to tell you this. I will hear me on this. I'm just going to say it because some of you like to budget. I'm just going to encourage you for the next four months to budget $25 a month. Put it off to the side. Don't, just let it sit there because over the next four months, you're going to be hearing about ways we can give to our community. All right, I'm not, I, Katie, I'm not going to steal your thunder because I want you to unpack it because it's so good. But just know that we're going to be investing in people. We're going to be investing in our city. We're going to be investing in spreading the gospel all over the world. So just make sure you budget for that. So this is what I want you to do. I want you, if someone's close to you, you trust them. They're, they're not looking at you funny because they're, they're normal and you accept them uh, because they're probably your spouse. This is what I want you to do. I want you to look at someone who is close to you and I want you to ask them, what do you want to do with your life? What do you want to do with your life? Ask them. If they, if they respond back with, I want to rock, that means, that means they have listened to way too much Twisted Sister and they watched MTV when they actually showed music videos and not television, all right? That's what that means. You're welcome for the free impersonation. That was pretty good one, wasn't it? I thought I was, I was good. But here's the deal. What do you want to do with your life? Some of you are like, man, I, I know what I want to do. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a teacher. Man, I want to be in the, I want to be, I want to own my own business and I'm an entrepreneur. I'm going to be a chef. Those are awesome. Those are awesome. We need those careers, right? Those are amazing careers. And hear me on this. Sometimes we go to church and we're like, oh man, the only way you're going to have an impact is if you're a pastor or a missionary. <laughs> Hogwash. You know where you're going to have an impact? When you're in the marketplace showing the love of Jesus Christ. That's how you're going to have an impact. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a missionary. You can be 
who God has called you to be. And those are amazing careers. My question to you, though, is what are your ambitions, your aim when it comes to the cause of Christ? What's your ambitions or your aim when it comes to the cause of Christ? Maybe we've been asking the wrong question. Because sometimes we ask the question, where does, my, where does God fit into my life? Right? Anybody ever ask that question? Where does God fit into my life? But maybe we should be saying, where does my life fit into God's story? See the difference there? One says, man, I'm going to make some space, a little bit of space and wherever it could be to allow God to have a portion of me. The other says, God has all of me. Now, how can I fit my life into his story? You see, Paul's life was a part of a greater story. He had a desire, he had an ambition, right? I'm gonna go preach the good news to people who have never heard. I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go to Rome, and then he finally gets to Rome, and when he gets to Rome, he's in prison, and then ultimately beheaded. And you can be like, well, he didn't, that was his aim? That was his goal? No, that wasn't his aim or that was a goal. He just wanted to preach to people who had never heard before. But in those moments, what did God do? God took tragedy and brought about victory because that's who God is. And so if Paul looks back on his life and he's like, man, I didn't accomplish what God had set out for me to accomplish. No, I believe Paul would say the sacrifice was worth it. So when you look back at your life, will you see regret or will you see purpose? When you look back at your life, will you see regret or will you see purpose? You see, what did Paul do? Paul seen his life through the lens of eternity. When he put on those spiritual glasses, right? I just cleaned them and they're still filthy, crazy. But here's the deal. You take your glasses off, but you put them on and now you see 2020, you have focus. Paul's lenses were eternity. What does God want from me in light of eternity? What's God's will for your life? Start with his purposes here on earth. Unpack those five purposes that we already talked about. Serving others, accepting others, building up others, helping others. That's God's will for your life. That's how we need to treat people, how we have to be willing to speak to people. I love this next generation. I love them. They're, they, man, they're passionate about social justice, about issues and concerns. Man, I love their passion. I truly do. I, I, I love to see seeking after a cause and, and going after it with all of their heart. But Paul is saying, listen, have that same passion when it comes to what God's kingdom is asking of you. What is your purpose here on earth? God's purpose on earth is what? That none should perish, that we would be the hope of the world. A few months ago, I, I, I officiated a funeral for my friend, uh, my childhood friend, Scott, who passed away from Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. But just, just a few weeks before that, I had a conversation with him on the phone. And I remember talking with him, and then I got to the point where I said, hey, Scott, let me ask you. Man, you had a, you had a conversation with somebody in Arizona a number of months ago, and uh, I know this individual asked you if you had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and it was in that moment where you said no, and you prayed with him to receive Jesus. Man, I'm just calling to, to confirm what God has done in your life. And man, I'm so excited that you made that decision. And on the other end of the phone, you know what I heard? Was crying. Now understand something, this was the, one of the biggest dudes I had, I'd ever known personally. One of the strongest men I'd ever seen. He would beat people up with one, I mean, he was a big boy. But my purpose was not to celebrate his size and what he's done for me. My purpose in the phone call was to make sure that his life was in line with the callings and the purpose of Jesus Christ. My purpose and calling was to make sure that his name was written in the Lamb's book of life. That when he took his last breath on earth, he would take his first breath in heaven. That was my calling. That was my purpose. That was my aim. That was my ambition. Why? Because that's where God wants us, is to have eternity in mind. And so which leads me to point number three is are you willing to place a high priority on reaching those who have never heard? Now, look, I know last week we talked about it. We celebrated how much we gave to missions and what our goals are this year. You know, so last year, $72,000. And maybe we want to see God do something powerful. We talked about our special missions projects. $11,000 is our goal here. Let me just break it down for you simply like this. Over the next two months, if every family unit, every, every unit, not every person, just every family unit gave $50 to the special missions project, not $50 a month, but just a one-time donation of $50, we would give over eight grand to the special missions project in two months. 
with every family unit sacrificing and being generous with $50. That could literally change the world. And I'm not pulling you, don't, you don't have to hop on now, and I'm not trying to guilt you, and I'm just encouraging you that there's an opportunity, what? To see what the kingdom of God spread th- so that all could hear. And so we're passionate about what God wants to do globally. But my, my challenge to you is that's what he wants to do globally. Well, what does he want to do locally? What does he want to do in your community, in your city? What does he want to do in your marketplace ministry? What does he want to do in your home? Because if you can't serve here, you will never be able to serve overseas. If you can't love the people here, you'll never be able to love the people overseas. If you can't give here, you'll never be able to give overseas. And what I mean by that, it starts right here where God has you placed. Does your heart break for the people you get to see each and every day? I wonder if too many Christians are more concerned with hanging on to the life ring than throwing it out to someone who is drowning. Right? We're holding on to it. We have the hope of the world. It, I love that we sung, we, first time we sung the, word, the song Breakthrough this morning. And it talks about waves crashing over. And yet, Jesus, would you come to my rescue? There is a whistle that is in my office that I've had for a number of years. That maybe someone who's watching online, Chelsea may, herself may even remember this. But I preached a sermon when I was a youth pastor. And I had a whistle. And I said, listen, for this day, I'm not a pastor. I'm a lifeguard. And my my job as your youth pastor is to make sure if I see you drowning that I blow the whistle and I let go of that life raft and I that life ring and I throw it to you because in that moment you are in need. And so what I did after that sermon is I hung it on our projector screen where our worship lyrics were and every week it was there. And when I left I took it down, I took it with me and I still have it. Why? Because I'm never off duty. But hear me on this. It's not just me, it's you. You're always on duty as a lifeguard. You have the hope of glory within you if you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. You're following after him. Then that that means you're on duty. You're a lifeguard. You should be carrying a whistle with you. And if somebody is drowning, it's not up to you to hold on to the life ring and go, it's all mine. Or you wouldn't do that. If you saw someone drown, you wouldn't go, oh, I have the answer. It's right here. Hi. So good to see you. No, what would you do? You would throw it in so that they would be rescued. Stop holding on to the love and the hope that is within you and let it go so that others may be rescued. It's not meant for us to hoard. It's meant for us to give. See, our desire is to reach the unchurch. Until everyone in our community has a real relationship with Christ, we will never be satisfied. We'll never be satisfied. Now hear me on this. There are people who have moved into the area and they were at a church serving somewhere and now they're here serving Right? There, are, there are people who, have, who have, were at wonderful churches and they just felt like it was their time to move on and you're here. I'm grateful. Right? I'm grateful. I'm grateful for that, that you are, you've partnered with us, that you're serving with us. But my, my, my heart is not just numerical church growth. It's to make heaven crowded. That's my heart. That's my passion. And can I just for a moment, I'm just going to take a quick break. Is that okay if I just take a quick just a small break and then I'll get done and then we'll dismiss and we'll pray and you'll get out of here. Regular attenders, hear me on this. There are times, there are times when it can come across that Pastor Lance is a rude jerk, right? And you're like, no, I've never seen that. And some of you are like, oh, I've seen it. But, but hear me on this. Because what will happen is after service, you're like, man, I just want to go talk to the pastor, but he's always talking to somebody else. Why doesn't he make time for me? It's not that I don't care. And it's not that I don't love you. I just don't know who is in the building that has yet to have the life ring given to them. By show, let, me, let me show you an example. By a show of hands, and if, you're not, if you don't raise your hand, don't feel guilty. We're going to pray with you at the end of the service. If you have surrendered your life to Jesus, you are a follower of Christ, would you just raise your hand? It's okay. You raise your hand, right? So there, there may be someone who's watching online. There may be people in person who have, never had, who have never surrendered their life to Christ. They have never received that rescue, that life ring. It's not that I don't care about you. There's just a moment where I want to make a connection maybe with a first-time guest, a second-time guest, a third-time guest, someone who's who's in need of help, and there's an opportunity for me to throw the life ring. It's like Jesus saying, listen, the 99 sheep are going to be okay, but there's one who's ran away. I will go after the one. It's not that he didn't care about the other 99. He just knew the 99 could take care of themselves for a moment. So it's not a lack of caring. But let me tell you how this works. It was just a few weeks ago. I wasn't preaching. I think Pastor Anthony was preaching. And I, 
He was getting ready to close, and I happened to walk through because I was doing something, and I was walking through, and I was on a mission, and this young man stopped me, and he said, hey, Pastor, can I just talk to you for a minute? And I understand that I had not had the privilege of meeting this young man yet. And he stops me dead in my tracks, and I was on a mission, and I knew I needed to stop. I needed to pause, and I said, yeah, man, let's talk. What's going on? And he begins to share with me about the struggles that he's having with addiction and how he wants to serve God, but he just keeps those demons, those inner struggles keep finding their way forward. And in that moment, he said, could you just pray for me? And all of a sudden, I began praying with him in the middle of our foyer while you were listening to someone preach, and this dude's just shedding tears. It's not that I didn't care what was happening here in the moment. There was one who was in need. And if that means God wants to use me, then I want to be there for the person in that moment who had the need. So it's not that I didn't care. I just know that God wanted me to use me in that moment. So just know it, man. I, I, I love, I do care. So just give me some grace sometimes. Like, I'm probably on a mission. <laughs> Right, just remember, Pastor Lance is probably on a mission. He's probably going to do something. He's probably going to talk something. He's not trying to be rude. He's not trying to ignore me. And I promise I will work on it. I will do better. As your pastor, I will do better. But the scripture goes on to say in Romans 15, 21, it says, I have been following the plan spoken of in scripture where it says those who have never been told about him will see and those who have never heard of him will understand. That's a quote from Isaiah 52, 15. Did you know sometimes it's easier to reach a person who... Um, who is not entrenched in religion or corrupted teaching. There, there's a group, the fastest growing group of society are the nuns. They're the, they're the people who don't have a belief system and that, that they really don't care about it because they have no pre preconceived notions of what church is supposed to be or what it's supposed to be about, who Jesus is or anything about him. I love what Jesus did in Matthew chapter nine. His disciples and him are invited to a party. They're gonna go to Matthew's house because Matthew's invited them over and Matthew is a tax collector. In biblical times, tax collectors were con artists. They ripped you off. They would charge you four or five times as much. It didn't matter. They were just in it for the money. And now Matthew is inviting Jesus into his home and now Matthew invites some of his friends over. And so now you have disciples and Jesus hanging out with a bunch of tax collectors. And then there's this group called the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the super religious people of their time. All right, they're the ones who thought they had all their act together on the outside. They looked really clean. They looked well together, put together. They had the smile on their face. And, and all of a sudden they show up and then they begin asking questions. And they, they say this to the disciples. Why does your teacher eat with such scum? Sometimes you just got to read the Bible, people. I'm saying it's just in there, right? Why does your teacher eat with such scum? Why does he eat with those people? Everybody say those people. Right? Why is he eating with those people? people why is he hanging out with those people will Jesus hurt him and then all of a sudden Jesus shoots back who needs a doctor the healthy or the sick and then he says now go and learn the meaning of this scripture what was he saying he said I'm after mercy not religion he said, I'm after mercy, not religion. He's saying, listen, I'm not here for the insiders I'm here for the outsiders I came to give my life for those people that's what he was trying to tell them that's what he's trying to tell the Pharisees listen it's those people that I'm going to give my life for Some of the five hardest words for us to say is this. It's not all about you. It's not all about you. Pastor, the music was too loud. Say those five words. It's not all about you. Pastor, I don't like that new song. I've been begging for that song for a year and a half since it came out, right? That's my favorite song. Like that thing gets me, gets me pumped up. It gets me excited knowing that there is a breakthrough coming, that God, the God that created the heavens, the earth is fighting for me and one day my victory will be attained. Man, it, man it's just passionate, right? And you're like, I don't like it. It's okay. It's okay. You don't want to know why? Because they didn't write it for you. They wrote it so God would receive glory. Because it's not all about me. Well, Pastor, you don't understand. I wish we had. I wish we had haze. Like, so when the drummer, I don't know, Josh was feeling it this morning. I thought he was going to break these things, and they're new, so don't do that. But, like, if we just had some haze, and it could go over the drummer while he was playing, that would be great. I wish we had. And we need to remember it's not all about us. Do you know what we are? We are a church for hurting people. We are a church for the outcast, the rejected. We are a church for people who are looking for hope. We are a church for those who are struggling in their anger. We are a church for, for those that are struggling with, their, with, with, a, with addiction. We are a church for those who have been rejected by religion. That's what kind of church we are. 
But are we willing, as Romans 15 says, to be willing to be that kind of church? Because here, let me, hear, let, me, let me share this with you. We are a rescue station for the lost, not a, not a resort for the members. Amen. Right? We are a rescue station for the lost, not a resort for the members. Like when you, ha- when you become a member, if you're expecting when it's communion time and you break out the wafer, which is symbolic for the body of Christ, you break out that wafer. If you think, if you think that one of the ushers who are serving you or one of the hosts that are serving you that day are going to be walking by and they're going to be like, Ma'am, sir, would you like any gray poupon with your wafer this morning? We have this for you. That's not going to happen. This is in the country club. Like we're, this is an opportunity where, where God wants to move, and this is a rescue station for the lost, for the hurting, not a resort for the members. So if we're a rescue station, then what does that mean? It means our heart's desire is that we would be willing to reach people. I mean, you think about it, what is Radiant Life? Why does Radiant Life Church exist? It, we are a church of real people pursuing life change through Christ to serve our communities. It's real people. What does that mean? A real relationship with Christ. Ex- what? Pursuing life change. Life change is about when we, we line up our life in light of God's glory and we begin to see, man, there's some things in our life that need change and God begins to speak to us. And then we're here to serve our communities. And so what does that mean? It means we have to be willing to reach one. And so I'm going to close with five quick points. I'm going to get them done in under five minutes. You're going to be out of here. The goal of reaching one. Why are we so passionate about reaching one? How do we reach one person? How do we, how do, what does that mean if I'm going to, to reach out to someone? Here's the first thing if you're taking notes. is pursue one lost person to become their best friend. And you're like, what? Earn the right to speak into their life. Do you care about the person or just their eternity? What did Jesus do? Jesus went traveled around as he was, he would meet needs and then he would speak into their life. He wanted to get to know people. He didn't just show up to the, to the woman at the well. He didn't show up to the woman who was caught in the, the act of adultery and he didn't just challenge their sin first. He began to get to know them as a person. Are we willing to invest in someone's life? When, we, when we're willing to speak, are we, are we, are we, will we listen to a complete stranger or a friend? Now, if you unpack that for your your own life, you're like, oh man, I'll listen to a friend over a complete stranger. Well, get to know some people. Get to know some strangers. That way they could be your friend. And before you ever open up your mouth, live your faith out in front of them. That they could see. So what? Listen, just pursue one lost person and become their best friend. The second thing you could do, every day, ask God to send one person across your path that you could help, that you could serve, that you can encourage, that you you could speak life into. Just one person. The third thing, if you're taking notes, is every, every church service you attend, look for one person you can make a difference in their life. I, I don't know what everybody showed up with today. I don't know your pains, your struggles, your worries, what you walked in with carrying today, the baggage that, that you're holding on to. But did you ever think that maybe instead of using me, he wants to use you? He wants to use you to encourage someone, to to speak life into someone. Did you know that church is both a place to give and receive? Right, it's a place to give and receive. So as you're receiving, would you then give it back? Would you give that encouragement to someone else? Reach beyond your own pain to bless, to encourage, to walk alongside, to lift somebody up, to build somebody up. I I know this to be true in my own life. When I, when I willingly, sacrificially try to meet the needs of others, my needs are always met. When I sacrificially try to re- meet the needs of others, my needs are always met. Number four, if you're taking notes, is strive to invite one person to church. Strive to invite one person to church. Statistics show that 82% of people will show up to church if they are invited. What? That means eight out of 10 will say yes, only two will say no if the statistics are right. You, you only get rejected, that's pretty good. Like if you're in softball and you bat 800, you're really good. Eight out of 10 times, all you have to do is be willing to invite someone because to bring someone means you have to invite someone. And here's the last thing, leading a disciple, one person who says yes. I love meeting with people. I love unpacking scripture and discipling, but I can't do it all. But if each of us had one person, what would happen? What would happen? 
I said this before. If each, if each of us just reached one person, our church would go, would double in size overnight. It'd go from 400 to 800. And then the next year, it'd go from 800 to 1,600. And the next year, from 1,600 to 3,200. And from 3,200 to 6,400. Wouldn't that be awesome? And that's because you're just loving one person a year. That's it. And so I don't know about you, but here's the close of the message today. I look at Paul as he was willing to sacrifice whatever it took that all would hear. He lived with purpose, on purpose. And would you be willing to filter life through the lenses of eternity and live with purpose, on purpose? So with every eye closed and every head bowed this morning, if you're watching online, here in person. And I asked before, I said, hey, if, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus, he said, man, I want to be a follower of Christ. I want to, I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Christ. I want to surrender to him. And we think of this word surrender and we're like, it's, it sounds so negative, like, like I'm not good enough. When we surrender to the person of Christ, what we're saying is, God, I need you. And in that moment, your weakness becomes his strength. And you align yourself with Jesus saying, God, I need you. And it's in that moment where you surrender, where your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, where eternity is available. When his, God's heart is that none should perish, that's why Jesus came. That's why he sacrificed. So if you're here in person or you're watching online and that's you, you're like, I didn't raise my hand before, but I wanna raise it now because I wanna give my life to Jesus. Just all over this place and those watching online, you can click the commit button here in just a few seconds. With no one looking around, if that's you, I just wanna pray for you this morning. I wanna surrender my life to Jesus. I wanna live, I wanna live with purpose on purpose. If that's you, would you just slip your hand toward heaven? I wanna pray with you. Lord, this morning, we need you. God, this morning, we admit our need. We are, we are so lost without hope, but with you, the hope of glory. With you, there's so much purpose. There's so much passion. God, we just pray that you would speak to people, that you would encourage people. And Father, this morning, as we surrender to you, Lord, I just pray for every hand that is lifted, every heart that was open to you today, that they would receive from you. They would receive from you as they surrendered their life to you. God, that when we leave this place today, all of us would be living with purpose, on purpose. And it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen.